Hi, I'm Jim from the Wyoming State Museum, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at a couple of artifacts that are related to the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand, which took place back in uh, 1866. It's also known as the Fetterman Fight. Uh, I'll give you a brief history of the battle first. We'll take a look at the artifacts, and then if the weather allows for it, we will make a field trip out to the Cheyenne City Cemetery to visit the grave of a man who was involved in the immediate aftermath of the battle, uh, someone who has become a bit of a legend in, in Wyoming history. So in 1866, the United States military built two forts in what is now northern Wyoming and one in what is now southern Montana to protect something called the Bozeman Trail. The Bozeman Trail had been constructed to allow people to move from um, what is now central Wyoming up into southern Montana and then west to the Montana gold fields. The problem is the Bozeman Trail ran right through an area known as the Powder River Country. The Powder River Country was extremely important to Native American tribes in the Northern Plains because it was an area that, due to the topography, due to the rainfall, due to the aquifer even, um, it allowed for uh, an abundance of the raw materials, the natural resources that the Native Americans needed to pursue their, their traditional lifeways. In the 1850s, the Lakota tribe had actually battled the Crow tribe for control of the region. And by all accounts, it was a, it was a pretty long and bloody conflict with the Lakota uh, coming out on top. And when soldiers from the United States Army showed up to build a series of forts through the area, the Lakota were not inclined to look upon this in a favorable manner. I mean, they had just ended up uh, fighting, a, they had just fought a, a, a very costly war with the Crow to maintain control, to gain control of, of this region. And when the soldiers came up to build their forts, they saw it as uh, the soldiers making an attempt to take this, this hard-won territory away from them. And they weren't about to give up the Powder River country without a fight. Construction on the forts began sometime around uh, July of 1866. And really from day one, the soldiers and contractors who were building the forts came under attack from, from these angry Native American warriors. On December 6th, a battle took place, a skirmish took place, that was probably a catalyst for what would happen a few weeks later and become known as the, as the Fetterman Fight or the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand. On that day, uh, troops from the fort had pursued some Native warriors up over the top of a ridge that was just to the north of Fort Phil Kearney into a valley, a small valley on the other side. And in that, a lieutenant by the name of Grummond, who was a cavalry, cavalry officer, uh, he left the units that he had been assigned to to pursue uh, a group of warriors who were charging off, uh, seemingly afraid and, and running away from them. But in actuality, it was a decoy. And the setup enticed Grummond and uh, a couple of other soldiers to chase these warriors uh, down into a, an area away from the main body of troops where they were ambushed. Two of the soldiers were killed. Grummond barely managed to get back out of the, of the ambush with his life. But this may have set in the minds of the Native American warriors that this particular tactic, which these soldiers seem to fall for on a fairly regular basis, uh, it may have said in their minds that perhaps it was time to try this same sort of tactic only on a much larger scale. And on December 21st, that's exactly what they did. Now on the soldier's side, the U.S. military side, uh, the personalities involved, the, the names that you will probably recognize or most likely come across, are Colonel Henry Carrington, who was the commander of the, of the fort itself. Uh, there's William Fetterman, who has long been blamed for the loss of the soldiers during the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand. Uh, and someone else that I've, I just mentioned here was Lieutenant Grummond, and he played more of a role in what was to transpire on December 21st than, than a lot of people are, uh, have long been willing to, to admit to. Now, the Native American warriors, their force was made up of, of three tribes, actually. The Lakota had asked members of the Northern Cheyenne and the Northern Arapaho to come join them in their, their fight against the soldiers from the fort. Uh, for the Northern Arapaho, uh, some of the warriors who took part include Black Coal um, and Eagle Head. For the Lakota, uh, warriors such as American Horse and White Bull took part in the battle. Uh, for the Northern Cheyenne, uh, the decoys, and we'll get to that in a minute, were led by a man by the name of Big Nose. And uh, one of the major planners in the battle was uh, his brother Little Wolf. So 
uh, actually a, a large number of, of different Native American warriors, again, from three different tribes, took part in the battle. So what actually happened in the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand? Well, on December 21st, 1866, a group of civilian contractors and soldiers left Fort Phil Kearney and went west to a forested area to gather wood. As often happened, they were attacked by Native American warriors en route, about 40 warriors. The soldiers in the fort saw this, and Captain William Fetterman left the fort with a group of infantry to try and go to the woodcutter's aid. And he was joined shortly thereafter by Lieutenant Grummond and a contingent of cavalry. Not long after Fetterman left the fort, the Native American warriors broke off their attack and headed north up the ridge to the north of the fort, uh, probably trying to escape, according at least as far as Fetterman thought, trying to escape into the uh, valley on the north side of the ridge. Now earlier that day, possibly the pre previous evening, 10 Native American warriors had been selected to act as decoys to try and lure whatever soldiers left the fort that day up the ridge that lay to the north of the fort and into the valley on the other side where more Native American warriors were lying in wait. Now stories have grown up over the years as to how the warriors enticed the soldiers up over the top of the hill and includes and those stories include warriors mooning the soldiers and trying to enrage them to get them to follow them. But probably what happened was the warriors acted as though they were a sort of rear guard covering the retreat of some people who had been wounded. But they would fire at the soldiers, move on a little bit. Uh, some of the stories from the Native Americans were that the, so the warriors tried to uh, pretend that their horses had gone lame or their horses were tired, and so they would have to get off and pause for a minute, allowing the soldiers to little, get a little bit closer. Then they would mount up and move further on. But um, regardless, uh, the, the 10 decoy warriors were very successful in getting the soldiers up to the top of the ridge and then uh, getting them to follow them down into the valley on the other side. According to the Native American accounts, when the soldiers got to the top of the ridge, the infantry came to a halt. But Lieutenant Grummond and the cavalry, remember Lieutenant Grummond, we talked about him getting into an ambush in basically this same patch of land uh, on December 6th. Lieutenant Grummond charged down into the valley, chasing after the decoys uh, almost immediately. And according to the Native American accounts and according to where the bodies were found and according to archeological evidence, the cavalry was actually as much as a mile ahead of the infantry um, during the battle. Now, at, one, at some point when the uh, cavalry was deep enough into the trap, the trap started to be sprung. And it's most likely that Fetterman who by this time in his career at Fort Phil Kearney had realized that uh, it was a pretty dangerous world out there, contrary to the stories that have grown up stating that Fetterman was hot-headed and he uh, was desperate to go out and, and win glory for himself. Um, Fetterman was actually a very cautious soldier at this particular point in time. And the reason that Fetterman ended up taking his command of infantry down into the valley on the other side of the top of the ridge is most likely that he felt as commander in the field he had no choice but to try and go to Grummond and the cavalry's aid. They had gotten themselves into trouble. Fetterman saw that, knew that there was a problem, and he took his, his infantrymen to, to try and, and uh, give assistance to Grummond, and then he got caught up in the trap as well. And Grummond and Fetterman and all of the command of 81 men were killed by the Native American warriors. It really doesn't matter if it was Grummond that led the soldiers into the trap or if it was Fetterman who gave the orders to move into the trap. Uh, the end result was still the same, but the people who were responsible for the Native American victory that day were the Native Americans. For weeks they had been observing the soldiers' behaviors. They had come to an understanding of what the soldiers' reactions would be to a given provocation, and they designed a trap an excellent trap, and they carried out the strategy for that uh, to perfection. And at the end of the day, the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand turned out the way that it did because the Native American warriors involved not only outfought the soldiers from the fort, uh, more important, they outfought the soldiers from the fort. And so this is one of the two artifacts that I wanted to share with you today. There was a soldier stationed at Fort Phil Kearney by the name of John Guthrie. And Guthrie was, of course, not in the battle, but he is one of the soldiers who went up 
um, after the battle was over on the day that it occurred to gather up the bodies. He also went up and gathered bodies on the day after the battle. And years later, he put down a lot of his recollections on paper, and he also made this piece of artwork that highlights some of his recollections of those two days. Now, it's very interesting in terms of its content. And we'll start up here in the upper left corner and go down and show some of the details. Right up here in the upper left corner, you've got a horse going down the road. There is a two above that. Now, unfortunately, this is really sad for me. Um, there was originally a key that went with this. All these different little vignettes within this are numbered. And the key to what those numbers indicate is lost. We hope to be able to find it someday. It might have been transferred to uh, another State Department, and we just haven't come across it yet. The hope is that it's still out there somewhere, but in my 25 years here, I've never managed to find this the key to this particular drawing. But anyway, up here in the corner, you've got a horse heading down the road, move down to here, and you've got a lot of soldiers' bodies along the road. A lot of them have been scalped, lots of arrows. If you move up into here, underneath the number five, you can see a number of soldiers stacked up here. And this may actually represent where Fetterman, uh, where Captain Fetterman and Captain Brown and some other soldiers are found in a pile of rocks. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what he's trying to indicate, but it might be. If you move over here, you can see a lot of soldiers being loaded into a wagon. You can see the soldiers that have been doing the loading are covered in blood. Going over here, looks like these are being hauled by mules. And for some reason over here, um, there's a one body that's off here in these bushes. And that may be referring to a civilian scout by the name of Lee Bonte. I think that that could be what, um, what Guthrie is referring to with this body over here. And there is a number by it, so if we had that key, we might be able to tell. Moving down, however, we move into a part of the scene that looks to be the immediate aftermath of the battle as opposed to when Guthrie arrived on the scene. The Native American warrior on his horse. If we look down here, we see another Native American warrior who is walking away with the blood-stained clothes of one of the soldiers. One of the horses of the, the cavalry unit that survived the battle, but not by much. He was severely wounded. Uh, when the soldiers found him on the battlefield, and the soldiers killed him, uh, put him out of his misery not long after they came across him. Down here below, there is a soldier who is, has been mutilated. Uh, he's had a lot of arrows shot into him. Guthrie makes reference to a lot of crosses being carved into the soldiers. Uh, he's also been scalped. And then over here, you can see a warrior who has probably just taken the scalp of this particular soldier. Now, there's, there are some discrepancies here in that if you look at these trees back up here in the back, uh, you could argue that these have leaves on them. And this battle took place in frigid, freezing temperatures on December 21st, although it could be that uh, Guthrie just got carried away with drawing branches, and those, are, those trees don't have any leaves on them, but kind of looks like they do. Again, another number here, number four, which somehow associates with, I guess, the wagon. Over here, there are some wolves prowling around. But a really fascinating piece from an eyewitness to the aftermath of the Battle of the Hundred and the Hand. We also have this piece here, which again refers to the Battle of the Hundred and the Hand, um, but we don't know anything about this particular piece. I've tried to find some parallels between the artwork style on this one and the artwork style on this one, hoping that Guthrie might have been the one who made both of them. I have a feeling this was still done by an eyewitness, but um, I really have no way of knowing that for sure. The only parallels that I can see on this 
are on the roads, if you look at the way the roads are depicted, for instance, right, going down through here, and you look at the road going right down through here, that is a definite parallel, but it also could be that that was kind of a normal convention for artists to depict um, wagon roads at the time. But anyway, we've got similar interesting details here. You actually have Fort Phil Kearney. Another reason that I think this might have been done by a contemporary is that there, there's, it's a pretty rough drawing overall, except when you get to things like the fort. And when you look at the fort, there seemed to be, the artist was attempting to put in a number of details that if they weren't familiar with those details, they probably wouldn't have bothered to suddenly put in this, this level of, of detail. Uh, they make mention of the burial ground out here. And then you've got, of course, here, a detail of the soldiers piled up and soldiers gathering up the bodies. There's a wagon. And interestingly enough, there's another body over here in the brush that most likely corresponds with the depiction here in the brush from Sergeant Guthrie's drawing. Anyway, two very interesting artifacts. One definitely made by an eyewitness to the aftermath of the battle, and another one that may have been made by an eyewitness to the aftermath of the battle, but something we'll never actually know for sure. Anyway, that's all I have for you today in terms of the Battle of the Hundred and the Hand, except for our journey out to the city cemetery. But this video has gone on for a considerable length of time, so I think what I'm actually going to do is make that a separate video. If you're interested, I will make this Battle of the Hundred in the Hand video one and the journey to the local city cemetery to discuss the grave of someone who was present uh, in Fort Fulcarney at the time of the battle. We'll talk about that in video number two. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments. I'd be glad to discuss them with you, and we'll see you next time.